Well, when I was in elementary school, we had two patrols. Uh, we had the safety patrol, which uh, guided all the parents' cars during pickup after school, which I don't know whose decision that was to let 10-year-olds guide traffic, but that's what we did, and it made us strong. Uh, but there was another patrol called uh, the fire patrol, and their job was during fire drills, the fire patrol would set up in strategic positions around the school, and we would time how long it would take the children to get out. And then the director of the chief of the fire patrol would have the stopwatch that he got from the assistant principal's desk at the front of the school. He would time how long it took everyone to get out and then would go on the intercom afterwards and tell everyone how they did. Now, by the grace of God, at the end of my fourth grade year, I was chosen to be fire chief the following year. Yes, thank you. But then summer came. Summer months go by, school starts, we're living our lives, we're doing things. And then sometime months into the school year, the fire alarm sounded. And I was sitting in math class and I remember our teacher said, students, that's the fire alarm, let's get in a single file line and walk to the back of the school. I was a student, so I got up, got in line and began to walk towards the back of the school. <laughs> and it wasn't until like halfway there that suddenly the thought occurred to me, wait a second, I'm the fire chief. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be going this way. The, the stopwatch is in the assistant principal's desk at the front of the school. But as soon as that thought crossed my mind, panic hit my little fifth grade heart. I was like, but all my friends are going this way. The whole culture is moving to the back. And I sat there like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And it was a bit of a panic until finally I found some resolution inside where I said, wait a second. The assistant principal named me fire chief and her authority supersedes that of my math teacher. And so the identity she gave me as primary, fire chief is more fundamental than student. And so as I began to think that, I got the courage to step out of line. And I remember as I did that, my little fifth grade friends, you know, they made us walk with our finger over our mouth so we couldn't talk, but I could see their surprise in their eyes. <laughs> and as I saw it, I stepped out of line and I just had the courage to whisper, I'm the fire chief. And I started to move the other way and I could see all their little eyes on me and I was like, I'm the fire chief. And then I realized it'd been too long. So I broke into a sprint and as I did it, I cried over my shoulder, I'm the fire chief. <laughs> now, why do I tell you this? For this reason, your identity determines your activity. Who you are determines what you do. And whatever identity you believe most fundamentally will determine your course in the world. You see it? And what we're looking at in Peter is that God, because of his great mercy, has caused us to be born again. He's given us a new identity, children of God, because of the finished work of Jesus. And that new identity changes our activity. And it does not matter where the rest of the culture is going. Because the authority has named us something else, we move in an entirely different way. That's the book of 1 Peter. And as he's talking to this community of people, he's saying, so we're meant to be different. Not different weird, different good. Different from the culture, for the culture. To help them in a difficult day. And as we look at this passage where we are, this is a hinge passage where he's moving from some big theology statements to some activity statements. Here are the implications of what God has done. And as he does it, he's saying, hey, you should be different from the culture. How exactly? He's going to talk about the fact that we praise God in the midst of pain and we have hope in the midst of despair. That's where we're different from the culture, that everybody has pain and everybody wonders if there's going to be sunshine tomorrow. And I know for us, that's where we touch down with this book. It's a difficult day. And the CDC just put out a few months ago that 44% of teenagers indicated they feel persistent hopelessness and despair. The youngest among us in America right now, the ones who should have the most hope, the most confidence of a positive future, their whole life is ahead of them. Almost half of the teenagers in our country say, I feel a persistent sense of hopelessness. I don't have a confidence there's good in the future. Something's wrong today. That the pain and despair is hurting us as a nation and as a people. And yet Peter writes to a group of people who are being persecuted, they were losing their homes, losing their jobs, losing their reputation and their money. They were in the midst of great pain. And he tells them, in that pain, rejoice. And in the midst of despair, you have hope. And he tells them, you're different from the culture in these areas that matter deeply. And we need to understand how, because we're meant to be like this too. And so what I want to do today is, is this is the hinge verse. And, and so much of the application is going to come later in the book. But in this key verse, he begins to turn the corner and tells us two things we're meant to do. Two ways we run that are different from the culture. And as we look at them, one of them dresses our internal life. 
and the other one in our external life. And both of them, uh, as he gives us these two what's, he kind of packs both of them in with some why's and some how's. Okay, so we'll look at those. But the first what that we're meant to do, how we're meant to be different from the culture in a difficult day is in verse 13. He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace of God that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's your first command from Peter. Fully hope. Set your hope fully on the grace of God that will be revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your hope. And that word hope in the Bible is not wishful thinking, like I hope I get parking out here in front of the Howard. It is a sense of confident expectation. I know good is coming for me in the future. He said, so I want you to have a confidence that good is coming and I want it to be rooted in the kindness of God that will be revealed in Jesus Christ. Now that answers a great question for us. Why? Why would I have hope? Why can I have encouragement in the difficult days? If great what's only happen because of great why's, why should we do this? I mean, Annie sang it. We watched it this weekend with the kids. The sun will come out tomorrow. And I'm listening to that. And I'm like, how do you know that? You don't know that. It may not, Annie. It could get worse. <laughs> and sure, you have a sense of confidence that the sun will come out because they did it yesterday and the day before and so on, but you don't really know. And yet Peter's telling us you have a firm confidence that good is waiting for you in the future. How? It's great. Later in the book, he tells us to always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. What are the reasons for our hope? Why are you happy while the world's sinking in despair? Well, if you notice in verse 13, he says, therefore, set your hope fully. And therefore is a linking word, right? That there was an activity done and those implications of that mean you're supposed to hope, which is consistent with the pattern of the whole New Testament. All of our activity is response. God has moved, so we move, just like that. That's how it works, right? And so all of the Christian activity is a reaction to what God has done. We live in the therefore. So what's it there for? Well, I won't re-preach all of the first section, but he gives this big, long sentence of all that God has done. We have hope, not because of who we are, but because of who he is and what he's done, that he opened the letter with this great salvo of praise, this super long sentence where he says, God is worth praising. Why? Because out of his great mercy, he caused you and I to be born again through Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. He said that our future confidence is based on a past action. And that past action was we saw the despair and the sadness and the injustice of the world, not just attached to us, we saw it attached to him. And we saw our wrongdoing and our sin and our despair land on Jesus. We saw it murder him and bury him in the dirt. But then he rose from the grave. And we saw that all the sickness and all the sadness and all the despair in the world that clung to him could not hold him down. That the cave of our despair, he punched through and made a tunnel. That he opened up on the other side and he looked at us and said, what I just happened to me was a transaction for you. It's not just me. I did that for you. That what I began here is now true of you. Of sin and death and despair could not hold me down. It won't hold you down either if you trust in me. And so Peter says, God is worth praising. Why? Because you have an inheritance in heaven that won't perish, won't spoil, won't fade. You have an anchor that's secure. Why? Because Christ purchased it for you. You saw that the purchase was good because you saw it get him out of the grave. So it gets you out of the grave. So you have hope. You have hope that God has a plan. God has a purpose. And even your pain has purpose in God's plan. That if you use the worst day in human history as a means for our redemption. So with you, your pain, even that has purpose in God's kingdom. So you can look at your life and say, my life is shot through with meaning because Jesus Christ has purchased for me life beyond the grave. And so as you think about all that Jesus does, you take that anchor and you set it firmly and forever because that's where I'm going. You see it? Set your hope fully. Therefore, because of what he's done, I now know I will see him again that there is life on the other side of this grave, right? So I put my hope in him. I set my hope fully in him, meaning I don't set it anywhere else because everywhere else is shaky. And so many of us, we set our hope on things that will go away. And that's what leads to despair. Now, Admiral Stockdale was the, the uh, highest ranking official that was a POW in Vietnam. He was a POW for eight years, suffered torture 20 times, when Jim Collins interviewed him, he asked him about that. How did you survive? He said, I got depressed reading your book and I knew you'd get out of there. How did you not sink into despair while you were in that horrible place? And Admiral Stockdale told him, I had an unshaking confidence 
that good was going to ultimately come to me in the end. And then Jim Collins asked him, well, who didn't make it? And he said, oh, that's easy, the optimists. He was like, what do you mean? He said, the guys that didn't make it were the ones that were like, surely we'll get out by Christmas. And then Christmas would come and they were still enslaved. Surely we'll get out by Easter. Surely we'll get out by next Christmas. Surely, and they kept putting their hopes on these flimsy, shaky promises that when they gave way, they gave way. Like our tax and the never ending story, just sinking into the swamp of despair. And some of you are like that. You're putting your hopes in this life for good in the future, and it's shaky stuff. For many of us, that's where we are. I just need to get that paycheck. I just need to get that title. I just need a clean scan. I just need a date. If I get that, and the longer and longer those things delay, the more you sink into the swamp of despair. For many of us, the reason we're hopeless is because we're putting our hope in shaky, flimsy things. And what he's telling us here is you've set your mind on what Jesus Christ has done. And that is an anchor that sure you set your hope fully on him. He's the only one worthy of it. And if the pandemic has done anything good for us, it's shown a lot of us that we built our hopes on shaky ground. And it's time to look for something more firm and secure, right? But here's a natural question. What I just told you was hope in the arrival of Jesus Christ at the end of history. That's your first command. Set your... Anchor your emotional well-being on the arrival of Jesus, which if we're honest, most of us don't think about at all. I'm just waiting for the resurrection, waiting for Jesus to appear in the clouds. That never crosses my mind on the metro. How do I do that? Because you're telling me to not just believe in it, you're telling me to hope in it. And hope is an emotion. Feel a sense of confidence. Feel a a positive emotional well-being Rooted in the arrival of Jesus Christ. How do you do that? It feels particularly distressing when you realize I can't really control my emotions, right? Like if I said to you, turn to your neighbor and and love them with all your heart on the count of three. One, two, three, go. You you, you could do a physical gesture, but but you can't suddenly love them. I mean, some of you are like, done, already there, stop. (laughs) But for most of us, you can't control that. But that's the first command. Hope fully in the arrival of Jesus at the end of the ages. How do I do that? Well, it's interesting. It's because he gives us two participles. Participles are verbs that participate in the main verb, and they fill out how you're meant to hope and set your hope fully on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How do I do that? Well, notice he says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice they both have to do with your mind. You can't really control your emotions, but you can control what you think about. And there's a link. What you think about will be what you care about. And what you care about, you will chase. That thoughts are the fuel of the fire of our affections. And so what Peter says here is, how are you going to not sink into despair? How are you going to be someone who's hopeful and not just silly, wishful thinking in the midst of a difficult day? You set your hope fully on Jesus Christ because you saw him rise and you know he's coming back. How do I do that? Well, it becomes with your mind. I set my mind on him, preparing your mind for action. It literally is the word, gird up the loins of your mind, which is a little weird, but it's an illustration. Back then, if you wore long flowy robes, gird up your loins, mean you tuck it into your belt. And the reason you did that is because it was time to move. You got to go. It was used in Exodus when God was setting his people free from the nation of Egypt. He told them, hey, eat the Passover meal with your gird, your loins girded. Keep your sandals on. He says, get ready. It's time to move. You don't got to get ready if you stay ready. Suit up. It's time to play. That's how he tells him to act. And so you go, man, this is the same mentality that Jesus presented in Luke chapter 12. Jesus was telling the story about anticipating his return. This is probably where Peter got this. And Jesus says, stay dressed for action. Gird up the loins and keep your lamp burning. Be like the men who are waiting for their master to come home so that they'll open the door when he arrives. Blessed are those who the master finds awake when he comes. People get ready. There's a train coming, right? That's how it works. And it starts with the mind. So what's he saying there? How do you gird up the loins of your mind? Think actively that I'm purposefully setting my mind. I'm focusing it. I'm preparing it for activity. And this takes effort, So he says, be sober-minded. That's the next part. Be sober-minded is, yes, it means don't be drunk, uh, but it means more than that. What happens when you're drunk? You're uh, not thinking clearly. You're not particularly attentive to detail. And so what he's saying is, how am I going to set my hope? How am I going to feel a sense of anticipation at the arrival of Jesus that I'm going to get my mind ready for action? I'm going to think actively, and I'm going to think clearly. 
that I'm going to purposefully turn my mind towards things that matter. I'm going to set my mind on him. Actively control the flow of my thinking because it's active, attentive thinking that's the key to hopeful feeling. Do you see it? It's interesting because sober-minded comes up two other times in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 4, 7, he says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded and be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. It's interesting when he brings it up, he says, you need to be sober-minded, why? So that you can pray. And then he tells him later, and if you're not sober-minded, you'll be filled with anxiety and temptation from the devil. Isn't that fascinating? If you look at your life now, how often do you pray? How often are you filled with anxiety and temptation towards distraction? If you're an anxious and distracted person, you need to sober up, is what he's saying, right? And for many of us, that defines us today, right? This is actually the enemy's strategy. Uh, in mixed martial arts, there's two ways to take you out. I can knock you out, or I can choke you out. And the way I choke you out is I squeeze you until you slowly lose the will to fight, right? I had a friend that used to do this to guys in college that weren't trained. He would just kind of loop them up, and then as they were going out, he'd go, shh, shh, shh into their ears, very condescending. <laughs> and it's what the enemy does to you. How do I get you out of the fight? How do I get you out of being someone who can bring hope to a hopeless world? I'll tell you why. I just slowly squeeze. Shh, 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 shh. Let's turn the TV on. Just soak into a screen. Hey, all this anxiety, distract yourself. Don't worry about it. And he keeps your head out of the game entirely. And you're playing the wrong game. I, mean, I remember for me in high school, I knew my football team was gonna be terrible. And I'll tell you the exact moment I knew it. We were in the locker room getting ready for the game and the middle linebacker, the beating heart of the defense, spent the entire time looking in a mirror going. I'm like, why are you fixing your hair? You're gonna have a helmet on. I'm like, this guy's got his mind on the wrong game and we're gonna lose. And for many of us, you are not particularly effective for things that matter because your mind is on the wrong game and we're gonna lose. And so he says, hey, if you wanna be someone who's hopeful in a despairing day, you don't trip and stumble into hope. It requires active, attentive thinking. Uh, the Lord made me live this today, y'all. I had to get an MRI uh, two days ago and we showed up there and right when I got there, they were like, hey, your paperwork's messed up. You may not get it. You need to call your doctor. You need to fax this. You need to do that. And you know, if you're in an MRI, you're in that tight little machine. And so you want to be calm while you're basically locked into this medical coffin. And, uh, <laughs> but there's all this anxiety beforehand. Hey, your paperwork, you have to get a fax and call this guy. He's on vacation. Ah, ah, ah. And so we finally get all the paperwork done. He's like, okay, it's time to go. Actually, we're doing three MRIs. So you're going to be in the machine for about an hour, hour and a half. And I'm like, what? Okay. And so he puts me in there. And if you've never been in there, you know, the, the, the ceiling of it's about right here. And the sides are touching my shoulders. It's a little snug. And I remember I get in there and I'm like, okay, I'm now alone with my thoughts. <laughs> and my thoughts instantly went to a movie, I believe starring Ryan Reynolds, where he woke up and uh, was trapped in a coffin and just woke up and realized he was buried alive. And my mind started to go there. And as soon as it did, I could feel my heart racing. I could feel my shoulders like, break it, break it. I gotta get out. And I was like, whoa, this is not productive thinking. So I remember in there, I was like, I'm either going to physically lose it or I'm going to forcefully, intentionally turn where my mind is set. And I remember sitting there going like, well, what am I going to think about? And most of us, your unguarded thoughts, thoughts are like half a song lyric. <laughs> and I was like, what am I going to do? And I was like, therefore, preparing your mind for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace of God to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I began to think about that. I'm gonna set my mind on him. I'm gonna actively start thinking about it. Why did Jesus tell us to be awake, be aware, be ready? Because you realize that we can get so caught up in things that don't ultimately matter. And for many of us, if we're honest, pain is the only thing that helps us do this. You don't think much about eternity until you lose somebody. And then when you lose somebody, a tether to this world gets cut and gets cast to the other side. And I began to think about my dad. My dad, in an instant, when he passed, knew more theology than me. And I went to school for a very long time. And I start thinking about my dad in eternity with the Lord. What is that like? What will it be like to see him? Not just see my father, but see my father as we kneel before the throne of Jesus Christ. And I started thinking about forever. 
And as I did that and laying there, I remember starting to think, and I was in there because they were trying to fix my back. And I laid there and I thought, you know what? They may not. They may not be able to fix it. And then I started thinking about my bank account because I had checked it that morning. And it was like, hey, that may not turn out. If all my hope is in my bank account, uh, the wrong people in office, the wrong downturn in the economy, and I can lose it all. So if my hope in the future is based on my money, based on my physical health, these things are all fading. And I don't know where your hope is set. If it's on your money, if it's on your position, if it's on your beauty, all of that stuff is gonna fade. Where is it set? And the more I started to think about Jesus, I remember it was funny because the guy would just tap in every now and again like, you still doing fine in there? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm good. He's like, wow, okay. I was in there an hour and a half and he was like, you did great. What happened? I was like, I just entered my mind castle <laughs> of thinking about Jesus Christ. Can be honest, for some of us, you rarely think about him at all. And you say, he is my Lord, he is my savior. Or maybe you don't believe in him, but let me just say something objective. Human history has been changed incredibly by this man, more than any other human being. And this carpenter from Nazareth claimed to be God. It behooves you as an intellectual to take him seriously. And I wanna challenge you, church. I wanna challenge all of you. Set your mind on him. First Peter takes my audio Bible 15 minutes and three seconds to read the entire book. You have that amount of time. I challenge you to listen to First Peter every single day this week and see if the flow of your thoughts don't change and see as the flow of your thoughts change, the flow of your affections don't change because a hopeful heart requires active, attentive mind. Confidence requires concentration and your feelings will follow your thinking. God's rigged it that way. So don't be a pass passive recipient of uh, whatever the world brings you. Many of us, if we're honest, all of our activity is shaped by marketers and what you care about, what you think about, and what you desperately want to buy and what you wish you had. You've been marketed to by people who just want your money and God wants to do something powerful with you, but you've given your mind over to lesser things. Shake the dust off and get them set on something that matters. Amen? All right, well, let's keep moving. Set your hope fully on the grace, the kindness of God that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let your thinking shape your feeling and then change your way of living. That's where he goes next. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's your second command. Hope fully and then be holy. Set your mind on him and it'll change your feeling about him, which will change your living about him because that's how we're wired. What you think about will be what you care about. And what you care about, you will chase. So as I set my mind on him, I begin to hope in him. As I begin to hope in him, I begin to live for him. That's what holy means, that I'm consecrated to him. And let me tell you something. We expect this. If you had a relative come home for the holidays and say to you, I have had a profound experience with the deity and it has fundamentally changed my identity you would say, okay. And then you would wait and watch because your natural assumption is prove it. Prove it by your life. I'll believe you actually had some encounter with the Lord if I see it play out, particularly when things don't go your way. And so they're gonna watch how you handle pain. And here Peter looks at this community and says, hey, We've been purchased by Jesus Christ and given a hope that can't perish, spoil, or fade. All these other things people are hoping in will perish, will spoil, will fade. We have an in, uh, inheritance that is sure, that we got it, it's in the bank, you can trust it. And we are guarded until that day. And even our trials are for his purposes. We have an enormous hope. The biggest questions in life have been answered for us. And so we should have hope when people are sad. And that hope should affect how we live. We should be holy. We should be different, set apart, from the culture. That's what holy means. And that's your second command. We hope fully, and then we live holy. If he's the holy one, then we're like him. We begin to look like his character. I think differently, I feel differently, and I live differently, right? That's what he means. Now, he's gonna give us two hows you live holy. Because again, that's kind of vague. Be holy, church. Okay, what does that mean? Well, he's gonna give us two hows, and then he's gonna give us a bunch of whys, and we'll run out the clock with those. Got it? All right, so the first how, how do I be holy? If God really has touched my life, I should change. How? Do I start wearing different clothes? Do I put Bible verses on all my stuff? How exactly do I change? Well, the first how, he gives you in that same verse. How? Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. 
I love that. I just want to say that to people all the time. Don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Uh, Notice the connection there, again, of thinking and feeling and living. Uh, That word conform means squeezed into its mold. Don't let your life be squeezed into the mold of the culture. Don't look like everyone else looks. But what's interesting is when, when Paul, he uses the same verb in Romans, he says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. And he contrasts them to everyone around them. Peter goes a little bit different direction. He says, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. He says, I want to contrast you not just with the culture around you, although you will be different from your friends when you trust in Jesus. He says, I want you to be different than the former you. That's how people will know something really happened, that you're not conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Before, you had ignorant thoughts and you followed those ignorant impulses. Ooh, I want to touch that. I want to eat that. I want to look at that. And you did all that. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You acted godless because you didn't know God. But now you know him. You're no longer ignorant. Ah, no, since you didn't know, have, not, have knowledge. Now you have it. And now that you know God, you go, you know what? My knowledge of him changes my feeling about him and changes my living for him. So I'm not going to look like how I used to look. So he says it in chapter two, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. He said, I used to do that stuff. I slept with whatever, ate with whatever, watched with whatever, and I could do it all, but something about me didn't feel right. That's what got a lot of you here, that you showed up in church because you're like, I'm doing whatever I want, and it's not working out for me. And he says, yeah, that's because those passions, those impulses are waging war on your soul. You go, I'm out of sync with reality. So yeah, I'm free and I'm right in sync with the culture, but I don't feel good about me. And he says, yeah, it's because you're ignorant. But you're not ignorant because constitutionally you're broken. You just didn't know. But the glory of God revealed you the person of Jesus and that you can know the kindness of God. You are a mess. You look like a mess. You act like a mess because you are a mess. You're broken. Yet God has come to heal and fix and change you. And as you put your hope in him, he begins to change your way of thinking. He begins to change your way of living. And I want to be a different person. And that will make you different. So he says it in verse four, since therefore Christ, or chapter four, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you, but they will give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Isn't that fascinating? You can tell how hard Peter's congregation was. That he's like, hey guys, the orgies, they gotta stop, okay? <laughs> like, what kind of church is that, right? Like, woo! He's like, hey, God has touched down in your life, so... No more orgies. And just, just a little something, church. Not just orgies physically. Some of you have never done that, but orgies online too, what you're looking at. So a little bit of a conviction there. But he says, hey, there's a way you used to live and you were drunk and hammered and given into all your sensuality, which isn't really about serving the culture. It's about using people. But God has changed you. And so you should change. If you've been changed, you change. If you have a new identity, you have a new activity. So basically all he's saying here is be what you are. God made you something else, so you should act like something else. Different than who you were and different from the culture. But again, it's not different from the culture so we can say we're different. Look at all these people. Look at the messes they're making of their lives, not us. That, that's not winsome and that's not the goal. It's fascinating all through Peter that he tells us to act differently, conduct ourselves differently for the sake of the culture. So we're different from the culture for the culture. We're like running away from the crowd. Why? So we can rescue them from the fire. That's why we do it, right? Uh, It's interesting with my MRI drama, uh, we were trying to get this paperwork thing figured out. And Donna got on the phone with this lady and was like, hey, we got some issues with this paperwork we need to get fixed. And the lady said, hey, it can't be done. I was like, what do you mean it can't be done? She's like, it'll eventually get done, but it can't be done by tomorrow. You're going to miss your appointment. Who knows when you'll get it again? And Donna was like, well, can we make some calls? Can we get this done? And the lady was like, no, I'm sorry. It's impossible. It never gets done that fast. There's no way he's going to get an MRI tomorrow. And Donna was like, well, ma'am, I believe in Jesus. (laughs) Which who says that? (laughs) Onto the phone. And she says, I'm going to make some phone calls and let's just do our best and see what happens. 
And so Donna encourages this lady to make some calls, do your best. I want to make some calls and do my best. And made a way, and I made my appointment. And, and Donna, and it's like, yeah, thank you. You're like, yay, MRI. Well, uh, but here's the best part. Here's the part you clap at. Donna and this lady are on the phone again. And the lady tells Donna, you know, no one talks to me that way. <laughs> and, and not just the name dropping Jesus part. <laughs> no one's nice when things don't go their way. And she said, you helped remind me why I'm even in the medical industry. It's ultimately to help people. That there's a God up there who made all of us and we're meant to help each other with the gifts he gave us. And, and you changed my way of thinking about that. Do you see it? Different from the culture for the sake of the culture. Not just to be different, but different good. That's what we're meant to do. That I don't act like I used to act. So when your friends find out you got religion, they're not gonna care. But when they see that you're kind and you're loving, they begin to take your God seriously. I used to tell college kids that all the time. They'd come to college, put their faith in Jesus, go home and preach to their parents and it wouldn't go well and they'd be confused. I'm like, it's because your parents have seen you your whole life. I said, here's what you need to do. Stop preaching. But next time you go home, do the dishes without asking, uh, being asked, just do it. Mow the lawn without anyone asking you. I promise you, you clean up around the house and your atheist parents will say, Surely there is a God in heaven. What has happened to my child? They need to see you change from your former you. And then notice what he says. This is the second one. A change in all of your conduct. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. It's great because back then, holiness basically meant uh, what temple you worshiped at. It was all ceremonial in their minds. Oh, that person's holy? Yeah, so they go sacrifice at this temple. You sacrifice to Artemis, you sacrifice to Yahweh, I don't care. And he says, no, that's different about us is holiness spills out of the temple. It doesn't stay locked up in church. For us, it changes the way you live out on the streets. That when God touches your life, it begins to change how you touch other people's lives out there. And the rest of 1 Peter, he's gonna do that all the time. 1 Peter 2, he says, keep your conduct, same word, among the Gentiles, honorable, so when they speak against you as evildoers, they'll see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of your visitation. When you're out there among the ethnos, when you're out on the streets, conduct your way with honor. Don't cheat people. Don't be impatient. Don't be rude. Why? So that they'll see your good deeds and honor your God. Let them see it in the streets. And then he gets it out of the streets and says at home. And he starts talking to wives whose husbands aren't believers. They came to faith in Christ, their husband didn't. And he's like, hey, don't preach at him. You live a life whose conduct has gentleness and respect. And he says, you will win over without a word by your conduct when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Let the way you live in the house change and your husband will see a change. Or he says it in 1 Peter 3, when people are slandering you, he says, you give them the reason for the hope that's in you with gentleness and respect having a good conscience so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Let me tell you two facts about next week. Something will happen politically and people will be upset, okay? <laughs> this is your pastor exercising prophetic gifts. <laughs> Something will happen politically, people will be upset, okay? What will matter is what you do with that thinking and that feeling. And if you do what everyone else does, you're not special. Yeah. And your God won't really matter. Yeah. But if you can respond with gentleness and respect, people will be confused. They'll think it's strange. And over time, it might be strangely beautiful that you have a different way. You can grip onto truth and you can have conviction. And yet you can be loving and gentle at the same time. That's different than the culture. And that difference is beautiful. We have a God who is full of grace and full of truth. And when we are the same, it changes things. But a natural question would be, why? Why would I do that? I don't want to be holy. I just want to do whatever I want. Well, we get a couple whys, and then we're out of here. The whys we get in one super long sentence from 17 to 21. We'll do it the best we can. But he gives us three that I'll t point out. Number one is we are holy because we're children of the king. He kind of hinted at it in verse 14. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passion of your former ignorance. I love the word obedience there is listen under. I'm not coming underneath whatever's presented to me on my phone and believing that. 
I'm coming underneath my God and listening to him. I'm going to get his word in my mind, not just whatever the world has to say in my mind. And I'm coming up under that. Why? Because he's my dad. In verse 17, if you call him his father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear through your time of exile. What he's saying there is we live different from the culture. Why? Because we look like our dad. We're meant to look like our parents. And it's interesting. I was talking to someone the other day about religion being a, a world of shoulds. And some people are so put off by Christianity because you're like, yeah, I should do this. I should talk that way. I should do this. That's not the way the Bible presents it. I see it in my son. My son is seven years old and he wants to be with his dad. And he hasn't reached the age where suddenly he has to suppress that emotion and be too cool for it. Right now, if I'm running an errand, he's like, let's go. Or I like, I'm just running to the store. Let's ride. Like he just wants to be where I am. He wants to be near me. He wants to wrestle with me. He wants to be close. He wants my attention. He wants me to look at what he's doing. He wants me to care. And the more he's around me, the more he'll be like me. Not to earn my approval or to become my son, but because he is my son. Children look like their parents. Uh, as I was writing this sermon, I was walking out in the woods and thinking about this part, how children are meant to be like their dads. And I looked and I was wearing a jacket my dad bought me and shoes that he bought me. And I was like, ah! <laughs> I've become my father. <laughs> I didn't even try. I wasn't looking for it. But proximity around him changed me. And he says, hey, we're meant to look like our dad. Why? Because we're his kids. And you're meant to look like your father. So hang out with him. Not because you should, because you get to. Because, because the God of the universe just called you my son. The God of the universe called you my daughter. That's beautiful. And I love that. He just throws that in there. Hey, and, and your dad is the judge of the whole universe. And we don't have time to get into all that. But what he's saying there is, hey, hey, you of all people should manifest his priorities, right? Like if we were on a sports team and the coach's kid was on the team, if the kid is always going a different direction from the coach's priorities, you go, something's off with this family. That kid should be the exemplary presentation of his dad's values. Why? Be because it amens and stamps and, and approves of those values. And it's the same with us. We should look like him because the world will take people more seriously that there really is a God and he really is the judge of the world. Why? Because I'm seeing the way he's changed your life. And you're not just his child, he's called you. That's the second one. You were called by the Holy One. But if he who called you is holy, you be holy in all your conduct. I love that one of God's names is the one who called you. That he is the holy one. He is the father of all things. He is the judge of all people. And I'm the one who called you. It's very personal. I'm gonna make my name, I want you. And I called you, meaning I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. And since I'm holy, you be holy. And what's interesting there is he quotes Leviticus 19.2, which was written to the priests originally. The priests in the Old Testament, what was the job of the priest? Connect people to God. That the way I live my life and conduct ceremonies, I'm trying to help people know God. And then he expanded it and told the whole nation of Israel in the Old Testament. And you're meant to be a kingdom of priests to the nations. When the way you live with God and people see your blessed life, they will want to know your God. So you're meant to be a whole kingdom to the priests. You got priests who are helping you know God. And then you as a nation are supposed to help the nations know God. And here he takes all that Old Testament energy and points it at us and says, you are a chosen people, a holy nation. God has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And he's called you into that to be priests. We're the priests of God to the world. We're meant to help the world know him. He has called us to a high role. So we're meant to embody his values. God has said, I want you to be my representative at your office, in your home, on these streets. You're my, I called you to represent me. And people need to see him in you so that they can see him. We felt it out here at the Howard. I remember there's a story not that long ago. Out front, we were cleaning up out in front of the building. You know, this is a big party town, so there's a party area. So there's all kinds of craziness on the streets. And several of our door holders that serve here were cleaning up the streets outside. And a guy walking by came up and said, man, what are you doing? You work out here? He said, no, we got church in here. So I'm cleaning up the ground. And he was like scraping gum off and all this kind of gross stuff on the ground. He was like, you're doing that for the church? Are you getting paid to do this? He's like, no, we're just doing it for church. And he's like, is Jesus Christ himself coming? <laughs> and our door holder was like, yeah, I mean, eventually, yes. We can get to that later, but... Yeah, we're doing it to make a way for people that they can come and know that God has changed us, right? And he was doing that, down on the ground, scraping stuff up, why? Because I'm representing a king, and this guy's taking Jesus more seriously because of my conduct. That's how we're meant to live. That we're a different people, called by God to a different way of living, different from the culture for the culture. 
And the last reason we do it is because we're his chosen possession. And he purchased us with something precious. And that's where he goes at the end. We conduct ourselves with fear, with a reverence for God, because when you fear God, you don't need to fear anything else. Knowing you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that uh, the lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. He says, you need to know you were ransomed from your futile ways of thinking. Remember what he purchased you from. I remember hearing a mentor of mine preach a sermon. He was talking about one day he had someone share up front that had lived a very hard life. And after very tough decisions and rehab after rehab, God got a hold of his life and he was clean and he was sober and, and he was preaching to a group of people. And he was preaching about the prodigal son, the son who ran far from his father's house. And he said, I'll never forget hearing this guy talk about that, the son who went to go live riotous living, as the Bible says. As the guy was coming to the end of the sermon, he got to the point where the son realizes he wants to come home. And he said, I'll never forget the way the guy said it as he was reading the text, he choked up. Because he said, and while the son was still a long way off, and it's like you could hear in that all the years, all the decisions, all the sadness, he was a long way off. The father girded up his loins and started to run. That's my boy. That's my child. I'm coming for you. And here he says, you remember where you were. Remember the futile ways you were that they were never going to get you where you're meant to go. And remember, God got on the move and he bought you. And he uses this wonderful imagery. Back then in Rome, if you were a slave, you, you could buy your way out. But the way you would do it is you would save up gold and silver and you would take it to the temple. And then the temple would cut a check to your owner. That's how they did it back then. It was kind of to get something official in the mix. And, and the, the metaphor they all believed was the God bought you out. But you knew he really didn't because it was your money. But you saved up money, you put it in the temple, temple cut the check, and you got set free. And the idea was, I'm free from my former owner and I belong to this God. And Peter takes that imagery and says, God redeemed you. He bought you, but not with silver and gold. You didn't earn it. Nothing you figured out. All that's perishable. He bought you with something precious. He bought you with the blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without spot or blemish. And he pulls it out of their cultural story and puts it in the great biblical story of like the people of God in Egypt who were enslaved. God told them, I'm coming to set you free and take a Passover lamb, an innocent lamb and shed its blood and put it on the doorposts to show that the blood of an innocent one is gonna cover your guilt. And when I send judgment, it will pass by you and you'll be set free. I'm buying you out of the land of slavery. He said it to them in the Exodus. He said it again to them in Babylon when they messed up again. I'm purchasing you without money. And here he says, that's what Jesus Christ did for you. I won't have time to go into it, but he starts to incorporate language from Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant, about a man will come one day and like a lamb is silent before his shears, he won't cry out. And what he's doing there is he's linking you to a bigger story. Hey, you were enslaved because of your sin, but not a lamb. That lamb was a picture because at the Passover meal that Jesus took, he says, all this story about a lamb covering you, that's about me. I'm the one who's come. And I'm going to shed my precious blood. I was known before the foundation of the world, before the world's foundations were poured. I was known by God, not just his awareness, but he purposed that I would come rescue you. And then I was made manifest in history. That means I existed before, but I stepped on the scene at just the right time. And I stepped on the scene and lived the perfect life you could not. And then I, on that cross, I took your sin, your shame, your despair, the injustice of the world, and I let it crucify me. And I was buried and I bled out for you. And my blood covers your mistakes, your sins, your shame. It purchases you. And then I walked out of that grave and I look at you and say, your sin, your shame, your despair, the injustice, it's real, but it's not final. Because what I started back then, I will complete in the future. Because this grand story is being written by God. And we don't just believe in a moral teacher, Jesus. 
We believe in the Son of God, Jesus, that what he did on that cross changed us from the inside out. And when we believe that, our faith and hope aren't in a teacher, aren't in wishful thinking, not even in our conduct. Our faith and our hope are in God. The maker of the stars knows me and purchased me. And I have a hope and I have a future. And that hope makes me holy, different from the culture for the sake of this culture, for his glory and our good.